Hello and welcome back to the KCC channel. I'm Rob and I hope you are having a wonderful day today. Today I have some stories for you from the malicious compliance subreddit. Before we start, if you're new here, make sure to hit that subscribe button. It's completely free and you can always change your mind later. But if you stick around, my friend Carmen here just might have some cookies for you in the near future. All right, on to the stories. Let's jump right in. This story comes to us from F Work. Am I remote or not? I live in a four season state and work in manufacturing. So this story begins when I got this job a couple years ago. I felt bored at my old job as a machine operator and wanted a challenge. So I took a job as a programmer for industrial manufacturing machines at a prototype shop. I had a bit of experience doing fabrication and prototypes, but no experience programming. This company promised me training, self-management, and the ability to work remotely when needed. I've been trained and have some good experience under my belt, but still a lot to learn. No one else at the company does what I do. Therefore, no one knows the amount of computer work there is. From designing parts or fixtures, quoting, picking tools, designing the process, programming, research and development, etc. We wear a lot of hats, so my job is a little bit of everything. Technically, I work in the back warehouse under two supervisors, my direct supervisor and his supervisor, co-CEO. Since I'm back there part-time and in my office on the computer part-time, I have two supervisors, I guess. It's kind of a weird dynamic and hard to explain, but just know it's poorly managed, micromanaged, and my supervisor and I hate it. Fast forward to a couple weeks ago, there was a snowstorm and the office had a half day. I live about an hour north from the office and usually get more snow than they do. I decided to work remotely for the day instead of going into the office. I got a lot of work done and I was proud of my accomplishments for the day. I briefed my supervisor on what I did for the day and he said, great work. The next few days, my supervisor is trying to implement a progress tracker since we have no way of tracking projects other than me saying how far I got. Just a simple spreadsheet, no problem, I get it. We are a small company and the CEO is a busy guy. He doesn't always know the status. And since we all wear many hats, the rest of the team should know the status also. A few days ago, I had to rush home for an emergency. Something was going on at my house. Not that important to the story. I mentioned to my supervisor that I will be working remotely the rest of the day. He said something along the lines of, well, some people didn't like that you worked remote last time. Your job isn't really a remote job. I was a little taken back since it's probably 75% computer work and I've been slow in the shop while waiting on tools to ship. I defended myself. It's not like I don't do anything. There's still plenty to do. The office was closed and everyone else in the back got a snow day while I worked remotely and someone got mad at that. He agreed with me. It's silly and we both know. I ended up rushing home, getting there late, because I was talking about what I should do the rest of the day and how to fill out the tracker spreadsheet so I can prove to the micromanaging CEO that I work. I told him I've never had to prove to anyone that I'm working before. I went home and ended up taking the rest of the day off anyway to deal with the issues at home and not make anyone upset or question if I worked or not. So yesterday, I got an email that we are closed tomorrow due to weather, work remote if possible. I asked my supervisor, what do I do? He said, well, do this or that, blah, blah. I said, no, I mean, my job's not really remote and everyone else that isn't capable of remote work gets the day off. You expect me to work tomorrow? He gave me a look as if to say, really? I spoke to some other coworkers and they aren't working. Why am I the only one working? Well, guess what? I turned my alarm off, I'm not logging onto my computer, and I might monitor emails in case something important pops up. My supervisor jokingly said, take a machine home with you to work remote, implying I can't work remotely since I need to run machines. Ha, <laughs> very funny. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called RatDad. It says, don't put up with this someone said tactic. Ask who said that. If this person is not in your management chain, ask why their mid-informed opinion is important. 
Ask your supervisor to please manage these perceptions and establish a clear policy so you can get some work done. There are two likely scenarios. One, management wants you on site but is not strong enough to say so. Two, management does not care to deal with the rumor mill and is happy to put the burden on you. Another commenter down below called Max Spring Puma said, Did anyone actually complain or was it just your boss? If it really wasn't a big deal to your boss, he could have waved away any complaint with a simple explanation. OP responded to this one and said, The CEO complained. He's the only one who cares and has complained before. For example, he had a modification to a prototype I had to make. I said, sure, no problem. Sat on the computer, changed the model, reprogrammed with new tooling, and slight change of process. Processed the G-code to put in the machine, and before I could set up and run, he complained that he asked me to do this hours ago, and I just sat on the computer instead. I started to learn that it doesn't matter if it's done right as long as it was done yesterday. It sounds to me like it's time to look into your job description and see if it actually does say remote work anywhere in that job description. And if it doesn't, then you take snow days just like everybody else who works in the back of the warehouse. I just want to say before we close this one off that your CEO sounds like they don't really know what's going on below them and that definitely doesn't bode well for the future of the company. This story comes to us from doing the Humpty Dance. Okay, you win. We will practice and play on the other field. Several years ago, I coached a kid's soccer team. It was a community recreation league with volunteer coaches with a focus on fun and equal playing time. There were two fields next to a school. The third field is a two minute walk away and hidden behind a thick stand of trees invisible from the two fields. One would never know it was there, but did have a small parking lot next to it, accessible only by a rarely used, poorly maintained back lane. Most people would park in the school lot and walk the two minutes along the path through the trees. The two fields next to the school were typical school fields, not particularly well maintained, uneven, and definitely not regulation sized, typical school fields. The third field was regulation sized, perfectly maintained, had new bleachers, and was maintained like a professional field with regular waterings, cutting, and seeding. It was the groundskeeper's pride and joy. It was the first day of a new season, and my team of 10-year-olds, the Brown Pandas, our t-shirts were brown with pandas on them, showed up for our first practice. Except there was another team on our assigned field, a team of talented players with matching socks and shorts were all wearing cleats and all in their late teens. I approached the coach and explained that he was on our field and that his field was a two minute walk away down the path. He politely told me to take a hike. He was there first and that was that. So not looking for a confrontation, I took my team to the really nice field. The parents had bleachers to sit in and we had a great time on the big boy field. After the practice, the groundskeeper Covener asked me why we were practicing on this field. I told her what happened with the other coach. She told me she asked the other coach to switch fields also. He told her to get stuffed and that was his field. Two days later at our second practice, his team was on our field again. The Covener called me over to talk to her and the other coach. She stated, Just to confirm for the rest of the season, you are switching fields with the brown pandas on the far field and your team on this field here? Yeah, this is our field, and the little kids will be on the far field. He looked at us arrogantly. Fine by me, I stated, grabbed my big net sack of balls, and trudged over to the professional field. Two glorious weeks passed, when during practice, the other coach came over with his team and saw our field. He approached me and told me that we needed to switch fields. I laughed in his face. Go get the covener so we can discuss. I turned my back on him and probably did something like tie a kid's shoe or dry some tears. Remember, they were 10 year olds. His team started trying to use our field. One of the brown pandas was scared of the bigger kids and started crying. A couple of parents stepped in and started shooing them away before one of the 10 year olds got hurt. He returned with his entire team and the covener. She was beaming. She asked him if he remembered our conversation of two weeks ago. He started to argue. She told him that we were keeping with the terms of that agreement and to go back to his own field. 
Go on, scoot, I remember her saying. We had our first game the next week. All the brown panda parents were in attendance, watching their children playing soccer on a beautiful field with semi-comfortable seating and a working scoreboard. As we left, we walked by the other team playing on a muddy, undersized field. They eventually changed their game dates and times so they could use the big field, but had to practice on the old field. The brown pandas never had to set foot on the older field all season. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Lost Wanderer Kind. It says, As a former school soccer player, that must have meant so much to the kids to play on a nice field. And the big kids must have been so annoyed. Way to stick it to their stuck-up coach. OP responded and said, It gets better. The field was way too big for these kids, so we used water bottles as goalposts until the goalie kept drinking from them and not putting them back in the right place. So we switched to gym bags and balled up sweatshirts. I'm sorry, this might be unbearable, but it sounds like this whole story was pure pandemonium. <laughs> I'm just glad that at the end, everybody was on a level playing field. I can honestly only imagine how excited those kids would be playing on the big kids field. That is a memory that they're going to have for a long time. So OP, good for you for standing your ground. This story comes to us from ShallowHal99. Procedure Documentation I used to work for a small company which was acquired by a group of investors, did not do a good job of hiding that they are planning to replace everyone with low-skill contractors and sell the company. For all of 2023, they've been pushing us non-stop to update our procedure documentation. Our senior senior manager announced in fiscal year 23 that there will be a monthly quota for procedure documentation. When there was pushback, his response was that it doesn't always have to be complicated procedures or a perfect procedure. He was always spouting something about not letting perfection get in the way of progress, etc. I was already thinking about leaving to finish my degree, so I immediately began the application process. But in the meantime, for most of 2023, I met my quota by documenting the most unnecessary procedures, but I gave them corporate descriptions, so it's not immediately obvious. Some of my favorites. How to turn on my computer, accessing information technology resources. How to log on to my computer, utilizing security practices for informational technology resources. How I delete and move files out of Google Drive allocating digital assets for collaborative processes, how to block your Outlook calendar, automating availability information across teams, how to request new office supplies from Staples, physical asset procurement. Since our team will be let go in any acquisition pretty early in the process, most of the lower level managers left or were checked out as they job search. My manager had been so distracted that they never reviewed any of my procedures. I asked for feedback on a few real procedures to make it seem like I was doing what they asked. And basically, they simply checked off that I've been meeting my quota. I left the job in December and have started school this spring, but I just heard from an ex-colleague who is still with the company. They just discovered my procedures. He just texted me and said, the senior senior manager is furious because other people were basically doing the same thing. And now, most of our team has left, and they barely have anything documented. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Edduivas. It says, if you want people to do a proper job explaining what to do, you should probably give them a reason to do it, or at least check that they are in fact doing it. OP responded to this one and said, you mean the minimal pay and horrible work culture isn't enough? But we provide donuts on Mondays. Gosh, no one wants to work anymore. Sarcasm. I don't think the higher-ups ever think that the people lower down are going to realize what's going on. But if all of a sudden they're asking you to document exactly how things are done for your jobs, <laughs> well, you can pretty much assume that you're not going to be in that job very much longer. They want documentation so they can teach somebody else who's going to be cheaper how to do that job. OP, I'd say you handled this perfectly. Let them flounder when they realize that all of that documentation isn't going to help them one bit. 
This story comes to us from Big Guy 011890. Not allowed to wear coats with hoods? All right, I'll put up with hypothermia. I, 34 male, work for a company famous for being anti-union, pro-insurrectionist sympathizers having two registers open with lines longer than the drive through lines at Chick-fil-A. The part of the store I work on is OGP as a dispenser, and during the fall when it's chilly out, we were allowed to wear our hoodies outside, along with heavy coats in the winter. Last week, a rule was implemented saying we were no longer allowed to wear hoodies. All right, no problem. So I started wearing my heavy winter coat as a substitution, which still had a hood. One of my immediate supervisors, let's call her Karen, also not her real name, because the name I originally used to describe entitled customers is Candace. I had a bad experience with her, but that's a story for another time. She tells me that my heavy winter coat still violates the no hood rule, and I had to tuck it in. I had a better idea because it was malicious compliance time. So I hung my heavy winter coat up and put my beanie on as the only way to stay warm, since no one was allowed to wear any form of winter clothing unless it was hoodless. The first day I saw myself in the two-way mirror, I couldn't help but think about the Spongebob episode, Can You Spare a Dime? Pantomiming myself shaking a tin can, asking, spare change. Most parents and my generation will know what I'm talking about with the joke. Anyway, back to the story, I started going out in close to freezing temperatures, and some of the delivery drivers started asking me where's my coat. I couldn't help but be honest when they learned we weren't allowed to wear either hoodies or coats with hoodies, and they wouldn't make exceptions for cart pushers and dispensers. This went on for about a week until, as of today, we got an update on the no coat with hood rule. Now, dispensers are allowed to wear hooded coats outside again, when dispensing, as long as safety is visible. I don't know what sparked the sudden change, but I want to think I had something to do with it when telling our delivery drivers and customers about the ridiculous rule change. Knowing this company would rather donate to keep insurrectionist sympathizers in office over having to pay out a possible class action suit. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Mental Operation 4188. It says, Class action lawsuits are a great source of extra income for Walmart employees. I haven't worked there for six years and got a $400 check last August. I think what happened in this case is that somebody put in a complaint about OP just wearing regular clothing and a beanie outside when it was freezing cold, and the company saw that as a legal threat so they decided to change the way that they worded things. It is kind of interesting though because OP didn't make mention that he had to actually take off the coat, just that he had to put down the hood or tuck it in. And honestly, a hood when you're working outside in a parking lot is a safety concern because you can't really see beside you. So I also understand the side of Walmart in this case.